Hi, I'm EAC Commissioner Ben Hubland, and today we're going to have a conversation about technology and elections. I am pleased to be joined by Ginny Bedanes, who uh, heads up the Democracy Forward team at Microsoft. Hi, Ginny. Hi, good Thank to be here. Thanks for joining me. Uh, so, I uh, wanted to just jump right into some questions. Uh, obviously, uh, most people are familiar with Microsoft, but maybe not the Democracy Forward team. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your work on that effort uh, and maybe some of the goals for the year? Sure. Well, as you know, it's a, it's a big year for elections. Um, and the Democracy Forward program, which has been around since uh, 2016, has been focused and continues to be focused on threats to democratic institutions. I would say that's kind of foundationally what we're set up to do. We think about that in a few different ways. Um, one is really around cyber protections. So we look at things like um, the actual election process, the vendors that support that, the political campaigns around that. Essentially, everyone who kind of works in the elections ecosystem, campaigns and elections, and how we can help protect them from cyber interference, particularly from nation states. Um, but we look at other areas as well. Another thing that we do a lot of is civic engagement. Um, we work across our different products and our different teams on how to engage uh, our customers on things like registering to vote. Um, and that's mostly a U.S. function that we, that we do with a lot of our product teams just to encourage people to have their civic voice heard and remember to go register and, and to vote. Um, and then we also do a lot of work in the information environment. So we think a lot about what is Microsoft's role when it comes to helping contribute to a healthier information environment. Um, and that includes, obviously, efforts around election periods where we recognize there's heightened concern around things like disinformation. Um, and we want to be a, a source and a helpful um, uh, organization that works with our partners and stakeholders to make sure that the information people are getting, particularly from our products, um, particularly around things about elections, is trustworthy and authoritative. That's great. Uh, you know, uh, at the U.S. Election Assistance Commission, of course, we focus on U.S. elections. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when I was... Um, when I was reviewing some of the materials and some of your work, uh, you know, one of the things that really stuck out to me in one of the articles was, uh, you know, 2024 is a big election year. It's yeah. a big election year in the U.S., but it's really uh, a big election year around the globe with over 2 billion uh, citizens around the, around the world voting this year. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, Microsoft's a global company. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, uh, again, sort of that work or what you're seeing around the world. Sure. The, as you mentioned, huge year for elections. A lot of them have already taken place. India just started their elections recently. Um, that's actually a process that goes on for, for several months. Um, the EU parliamentary elections are coming up. Uh, the UK will most likely have an election this year. They're required to have one by the end of January of next year. Um, and so there are some pretty foundational elections happening around the world. We have a similar approach to, to these elections as we do in the US. Um, we calibrate it based on where we have presence, uh, based on where our technology is being used, and a lot of times based on where there's sort of the, the need for intervention or for support in those spaces. Some of the trends that we're seeing, we certainly from a threats perspective are tracking what we're seeing happen, particularly by nation state adversaries and how, if, they're looking to intervene. So we watched things like the elections in Taiwan uh, for, for particularly influence operations and the way the information environment um, is being sort of attacked or not. Um, and we continue to track things in, in other countries as well as their elections come up. Um, and we're using those insights and reporting out on them where we see them. So we recently put out a report through our uh, MTAC team on, uh, it's called the East Asia Report, and that includes some reflections on things that we're seeing in countries like Taiwan. Um, but we also put out a report just recently around the US elections. And it's honestly more of a reflection, to your point, of what we're seeing in other countries as we look forward to the US election and where we anticipate uh, nation states in particular interfering both in cyber capacity, hack and leaks, and then also when it comes to influence operations. We are also, of course, tracking AI and where we think AI can or, or might be used as a, a sort of a weapon uh, in these elections, particularly in the information environment. So far, we're not we're not seeing a lot. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not happening and it doesn't mean that it won't. Um, but it is something we'll continue to keep an eye on and report out on as, we're, as we find out more. That's great. I wanna, I wanna get to the AI in a second, but, but one of the things you hit on there, um, you know, thinking about, thinking about influence operations, thinking about, um, you know, 
Uh, our federal partners at uh, CISA and FBI and ODNI recently uh, re up some guidance or are highlighting uh, concerns around foreign line influence. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, you know, this is something we continue to see, see foreign adversaries trying to divide Americans. And, um, you know, again, wondered if from a global perspective, you could talk at all about what you all have been seeing uh, in other countries as it relates to that type of activity. Sure. I mean, we have seen uh, Russia in particular continues to put out narratives uh, that tend to be focused around Ukraine, um, but they are doing it in, in ways that appear to be sort of strategic around uh, elections in certain environments. And so that's something that we anticipate and are looking for in the U.S. Uh, based on trends that we're seeing in other countries. Um, there are some adversaries who have not yet really weighed in. Uh, so, for example, we haven't seen a lot from Iran um, they are, of course, weighing in on things around Israel and Gaza, um, and we anticipate that that will continue. But it will be interesting to see if and when they show up uh, in, the, in the U.S. context. As many people will remember, we did see them, um, uh, an actor associated with Iran, uh, did the sort of Proud Boys campaign that I know you all are very familiar with, um, where they, they got a trove of emails and sent emails out to U.S. voters pretending to be the Proud Boys, the good news is, of course, that was debunked fairly quickly. The U.S. government was able to attribute, and we don't believe much harm came from that. But that was something that happened fairly late in the election cycle. So while, we're, we're, while we are, in fact, looking at other countries and their elections to see where we might identify activities or patterns that we can also anticipate happening elsewhere in the U.S. election, but also in other elections, um, so far things seem to be a little bit quiet, but there is ongoing activity. So those are the trends we'll continue to watch. Um, and again, our reports have a lot more detail on exactly what we've seen. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And again, yeah, I know as we get closer to the general election, that will, of course, uh, likely ramp up. And, and one of the, uh, I mentioned I wanted to get back to AI. And sure. so, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, obviously artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, generative AI has has been a hot topic this year. I know a lot of people have uh, concerns about the potential for it to uh, amplify or lower the barrier to entry on, on mis- and disinformation. Um, and, uh, you know, I think for a lot of election officials around the country, and, and all of us, frankly, this is, mm -hmm. this is pretty new. And so the EAC's put out a couple products, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of it as just sort of an explainer or to give some foundational background. Some of it's around security. But uh, with Microsoft being a leader in this technology, uh, can you talk uh, a little bit more about what you're seeing or how you see uh, this new technology or this emerging technology potentially impacting elections and election officials? Sure. We know this is a big concern. Um, it's something that we've been thinking about for quite a while, and we have a lot of efforts underway to do what we can to uh, prevent, where possible, the misuse of this technology to impact elections mitigate it uh, where, where we're able to, and then certainly work with our partners uh, in the government space, in the election space, and elsewhere to see how we can help um, be part of sort of a solution if and when this technology is weaponized. But to put a little more detail around that, one area that I think is probably the most helpful to point to when it comes to details is that uh, in February of this year, we came together with 19 other of the largest tech companies in the world to sign an agreement um, in Munich that we we're calling sort of the AI elections tech accord. And that was around this challenge of deep fakes and elections, frankly. It was saying, this is a moment where we recognize the technology is going very fast. Um, society is not sure exactly what to believe when they see videos and, and images. And as we know, audio files can be, can be manipulated as well as we saw with the Biden robocall in New Hampshire. And that's just one example. And so with the emergence of this technology, how can we as tech companies work with others to, to try and, uh, again, prevent to the extent we can and mitigate the, the challenges. We came up with some very concrete commitments, eight, eight commitments that we, um, that we all as uh, both AI uh, technology generation companies, such as OpenAI and, um, and some of those other AI labs, as well as some of those on the sort of distribution side, like Meta and Google, and then of course a lot of us serve in both of those capacities, we all signed on to these commitments and said things like, it's important for people to know um, the provenance of information. And so there's a lot of work around what's called content provenance, um, also referred to as content credentials. And while we didn't prescribe exactly how the companies would do this, because each company has different products and has different use cases, we all agreed that it is important for people to be able to know where, uh, where a piece of content came from. 
Um, and then we also agreed to things like we need to work collaboratively um, as a tech industry. We also acknowledge the importance of working with civil society on these, on these things. Um, so again, the, the court itself has all of the detail, lots of commitments in there. What was really heartening was as soon as we signed the accord together, uh, 10 of the companies put out their own blogs saying, okay, we just signed this thing that is voluntary. We recognize there's no enforcement mechanism, but here is specifically what we are gonna do to make sure that we fulfill our commitments within the accord. Uh, Microsoft did that as well. And so from there, we are doing things like if you use Bing Image Creator to create, it's, it's sort of like Dolly, it actually leverages Dolly's technology. If you use it to create an image of something, um, it will contain a piece of information within the metadata of that image that says this was AI generated. And that can be read by platforms like Meta. So that when they go to, um, when someone goes to post one of those to Meta, you will see a, a tag or a label indicating that was an AI generated image. So we need more of this. This is not yet fully adopted. Not everyone is doing this, but we're moving in a direction where people should start to ask questions of the images and videos they see on social media. And there should be these elements that are coming from the, the AI providers such as ourselves that give them that sense of this came from AI. Um, or in some cases, we're working with, say, political campaigns in the US and actually we just announced in the EU as well, where we're giving them the technology they need to apply what we call content credentials to their own media. So if a political campaign applies the content credentials to the media that they generate, authentic material, so you know, just a normal video from their candidate out on the, on the trail, they, when they then upload it to social media or elsewhere, it will have a similar mark saying that this is authentically from the John Smith for Congress campaign. Again, these are small steps that only work really when we all are sort of collectively doing this, but it's moving in the direction of enabling people to look at and ask questions of content that they're, that they're receiving to find out, was it generated by AI? Did it actually come from the source that it says it's coming from? And eventually we'll get to a place where that is, that is the norm. We know we're not quite there yet, so some of the other efforts that were in the commitments and that we're working on include things around AI literacy, media literacy, societal resilience training. Um, it's important for people to ask questions, to be a little skeptical. Was that really the Pope wearing a puffy jacket? If any of you haven't seen this picture, you should look it up. It's hilarious, and I'll admit that I actually fell for it at first. Um, we should be more skeptical of the news and the media that we come across particularly if it feels like it's fitting a narrative that we already strongly believe. Um, and, and not just you know do our own research, but actually look at the image and say, is it possible that this was generated or altered by AI? So there's a lot of work underway to help people give them access to tools so that they can ask those kinds of questions and be more discerning um, viewers, ultimately making up their own mind about what they're looking at, but giving them the tools they need to make an educated decision about what they're likely encountering online. Uh, you know, I think uh, obviously this is an exciting new technology. It, it is, uh, I think it has opportunities. It certainly has challenges and risks. And, uh, you know, obviously conversations like, like those you were just mentioning are critical uh, to make sure that, that we proceed uh, accordingly. But one of the things you flagged there was the tools. And, mm -hmm. and I think about for for election officials sort of right now, um, you know, who are watching this, uh, you know, one of the things the AC was able to do, uh, we voted uh, unanimously to ensure that, uh, or to explicitly state that HAVA funding uh, could be used to combat uh, AI generated disinformation. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, election officials are uh, largely underfunded. We need to invest more in our democracy. And so, um, sort of with that in mind, I didn't know if there were any tools that you would point to uh, for election offices or, or best practices or just general information sure. that, that if, I'm a, if I'm a local election official somewhere out in the country watching this, that, that it would be great to know about. I'd start by saying, make sure you as a election official, um, someone who works in this space, make sure you have a plan for what happens if your principal uh, or someone in your community is, is deep faked, right? What happens, how does your office respond if a candidate um, is, if there's an audio file of a candidate claiming that a polling station in your neighborhood is, is down or is out or, or something? Like, 
think through a few of these scenarios and have a plan in place because there actually are some things that can be done. While this is a new and emerging field, it's very easy to feel like you're out of control if something like that were to occur. In many ways, I point to the Biden robocall situation as kind of a everything worked um, example, because in that case, the media very quickly jumped on top of it and started inquiring. Um, uh, the, the election officials in the state were very quick to do a review and to make sure that voters knew that it wasn't authentic. Everyone sort of played the role that they were supposed to play. Now, that was at a national level, and that was the president of the United States. So you have to ask yourself, what happens if it's a local candidate or a local, a local election official? There's still uh, incident response plans you can put in place. It's actually not that different to how you would respond to a cyber attack, except you do need to think through the scenarios, just like everyone's been doing tabletops for cyber attacks for the last four or five years. They should have similar exercises around what to do if there's AI-generated disinformation in their, in their space. Again, it's not that dissimilar to how you respond to a, a more traditional disinformation campaign, right? Know who the authoritative source is, point back to the, the correct information, build out the, um, the trusted relationship with your um, stakeholders, with your voters ahead of time, so that if something like that happens, you're able to be the voice of, of authority. Those things still hold true. It's actually not that different in this environment, but the scenarios might be different. And so be sure to go through and think about that. Another thing I'd say is look at the resources within the different um, tech companies of what you can do to report when something like this happens. That is slightly different than some of the other things in the past. At Microsoft, we have a portal where candidates and campaigns can go if one of their candidates is being, if they believe they've been deep faked, where we will immediately triage and respond according to our policies, but we'll definitely research and look at it. Um, a lot of companies have positions like that, so we just encourage election officials and others to be familiar with what those tools are. Um, and then ultimately, a lot of it comes down to the same basics that people have been working on for, for a very long time. Make sure you have two-factor authentication turned on all of your accounts. That's no different now than it was before. It's still essential, and it's still probably the, the biggest protection that you can put in place. Uh, we'll pause now for another PSA on multi-factor authentication <laughs> and checking out some of the toolkits on the EAC. Uh, we've got, again, as I mentioned, uh, the artificial intelligence or AI toolkit, but also things like the continuity of operations toolkit can help you put some of these plans in place. Uh, and again, I think, I think exercising these ideas, putting these into scenarios that you're working through with your staff uh, is a great suggestion. Uh, I, know we've, I know we've covered a lot, but I'm sure I'm sure we've missed something. So uh, as sort of a final question, you know, again, thinking about sort of this emerging technology and where we're headed and how that impacts elections from your vantage point uh, here and looking at elections in the U.S. and around the globe, is there any other sort of final parting thoughts that you would share with election officials around the country? Uh, well, I'd start by saying thank you. Um, I recognize that the work that you all do is foundationally important now more than ever. Um, and so I, I really do want to start by saying thank you for everything that you guys are already doing and all of the hard work you're putting in. I recognize that elections continue to happen day after day, even though a lot of us are, of course, talking about what's coming in November. I know that you have your own elections that you're running constantly. I suppose the only thing I'd, I'd leave with is um, while we look at the challenges of, of AI and deep fakes, it's, it's a matter of sort of considering the challenges but not over-hyping the threats, right? And I know that we're constantly trying to draw awareness to these issues without necessarily over-catastrophizing uh, what could happen. None of us really know what's going to happen in November. We don't know if our adversaries are going to launch big campaigns. We don't know if it's going to be cyber or um, hack and leak. Um, but we do know that there are certain fundamental things we can do to prepare because something will happen. And, and so as long as you all are continuing to follow some of the great guidance from the EAC and know what tools are available to you and building out these relationships with your stakeholders, I think we're all going to probably get through this cycle um, with, the, with that preparation. And that's about the best you can do at this stage. And we'll just kind of see what happens when we get on the other side. Uh, well, thank you for that. And thank you for joining me today for this conversation. It was, it was great. And if there are questions that, that you have or things that you see that the EAC can be doing on this or other emerging technologies, please don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, you can always email us at clearinghouse at eac.gov. Thank you. Thanks so much.